What does it mean to have no address? No address equals unemployment, no housing, no education, no place to call home, criminalization of innocent people, not a part of society, no shelter, though having an address equals solutions. This is the No Address Podcast. Welcome to No Address Podcast, where we break down the philosophy of having no address and what that really means. Welcome to today's show. We're doing part two with Miss Erica Wright of You First. Hey, and we're going to just grow right into it and pick up on your journey because you got back what? Uh, in October. In October. Yeah, in October. You got back from your journey going cross country, final destination, California. So tell me about that experience. Our trip was amazing. You first traveled from Atlanta to California. This is our second time doing this, but this time was amazing because we had an opportunity to drive back, which was so dr- different. Uh, we served over 10,000 hygiene kits along the way. We stopped in every state and local shelters. We met people under the bridges. Um, It was an experience, um, something I'll never forget. Um, During the pandemic, it really um, showed me that we really need to get back to humanity. Um, I think that our friends who are experiencing homelessness have truly been overlooked, especially during this time. Um, from every state that we visit, we recognize that the shelters are overcrowded or those who live without walls were afraid to go into the shelters. Also, um, there is a lack of concern for people who are in need of the basics, hygiene, water, food. Um, people are just almost scrambling just to make it day to day. Um, And this was basically in every state that we visit. Uh, We know as we came back that the cases had gone up. So I can just only imagine what was going on. For instance, in in Arizona, which was something that really kind of touched my heart because they actually had about three full parking lots open for the homeless community. They had their tents. They had these huge Uh, tanks full of water where people could shower Uh, they had washing stations Um, they also had the facilities for them to use the restroom and I thought to myself this would be a great model for other states especially during COVID and we know we're going to go into 2021 with this because at this point now you have everyone in a central location to me you can go in and do some great work you can go and talk to people see what their needs are and it was actually maybe 500 uh, yards from the local shelter there and which was already overcrowded and so at that point you know it, it, it really hit me that we are not taking care of people who are in need so um, the trip itself was exhausting um, because we were you know in the car every day we were driving at least seven to eight hours um, and then we stopped of course to make the donations in the shelters. We talked to people on the street, Um, you know, and then of course with COVID, you know, we had to be careful. We had to go into hotels. We had to take all our cleaning supplies. Um, But I I would definitely do it again. Um, I think that this is something that definitely needs to be confronted, talked about. Um, Of course, when we got to California where we served on Skid Row, from my previous experience seeing Skid Row, there were thousands and thousands of people. I must say they have cleaned Skid Row up a little. But from our conversations with the locals, we recognized that they were still there. Um, it was all about politics. It was all about the face of how it looked to have all of those tents during the pandemic and how um, dangerous it was. And so from what we understood from talking to people in their experience, that people came back out at night. They brought the tents back out or their sleeping bags. Um, and so even people there are not getting the basic needs. So there are a lot of nonprofit grassroots organizations that are still on the ground out here, you know, battling COVID themselves, you know, trying to, you know, make it, uh, you know, through their own experience. But they're still out trying to feed people and give them water and make sure they got the basics and washing their hands. And and so I'm just kind of baffled a little bit in being America because it almost looked like a, 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 a third world country 
on Skid Row. You know, even you go to the beach to look at the beautiful water and you see Tent City just all up and down the sidewalk. And so you know that people who um, experience homelessness, who are, you know, in transition, they sometimes move to warmer climates. And you can understand why, but now you're talking about not just a pandemic, but an epidemic. And you're talking about, um, you're looking at so much trash and debris. And when we talk about cleaning up the world, I just, I'm just, I don't know. Sometimes I'm just confused and I just don't get it. And what I'm confused about is that why aren't you hiring people to clean up the trash? Exactly. And this is in every city and state I've been in. This world is full of trash. That's right. That's right. But you're not giving people opportunities to make a living. I agree. And that's very easy. You don't need any type of education for that Thank or you. qualifications Thank for you. that. I think the other part that we were able to see in, in California, in L.A. area, Hollywood, um, we visit a shelter there, which was actually the Salvation Army in Hollywood that housed over a thousand people that were already overcrowded. Um, and when we talk about the homeless or people who are experiencing home transition, um, people who have just maybe lost their way mental, whatever it is, I think what really hit me was that sometimes people are trying to trying to give them the basics, but they're not trying to hear their stories. They're not trying to give them wraparound services. So how many people did I see? And of course, you know, you hear the stories about people go to L.A., they want to be a star and they get on drugs and boom, boom, boom. Well, what 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 are we doing in America that we can help people before they get there? You know, going into the schools, going into the high schools, having these conversations before a child just think I can just go to L.A. on the bus and I'm going to make it, you know. And so we know the percentage of people doing that is what uh, very, very small. But at the end of the day, if we're having these conversations with children before they get there, maybe we can stop the uh, repeated cycle. Because at the end of the day, a lot of those young kids that I saw that were, you know, shaking and rocking and just didn't know where they were. And, you know, people always want to say marijuana is the gateway drug, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about a person who just maybe got there and was just in awe of, oh, my God, I can't make it. What do I do to embarrass to call mom? And next thing you know, they're sitting on the curb in Hollywood and they're in a mental state. So I just think that, you know, we have to do a better job of, yes, hiring those people who can clean up around there. Because there are people who were on Skid Row who have been there for years. We met a lady named Stephanie. She lived there for eight years. Her tent looked like an apartment, but she can't afford to stay in an apartment, um, uh, get housing in L.A. Um, she, she can't even think about it. So even a person like that, how do they transition out of there? Even if they want to go to another state, you go to another state, you're still homeless. So I just think that um, I think a lot of conversations are not being had. I mean, I know that, you know, with grassroots organizations, we're out on Instagram and Facebook and we're talking about what we're doing. You know, even this time of the year, I'm just like, oh, they're going to go out. <laughs> They're going to feed for the holiday. And in January, nobody's going to be back out there. I think we have to stop it. I think we have to stop in our tracks. I think we have to get to the table. I think we have to pursue our leaders to make sure that, that those fundings are trickling down to those who are boots on the ground so that not only we can give people the immediate services that they need, but we can also start to, to help do a graft of how this would look if we're really going to do something about this situation. And until we do that, all we're going to keep doing is just a repeated cycle every year, every year, you know, look at how much money we raised, look at where we are, look at what we did. And at the end of the day, you know, when we go out on, on, on the days that we go out and we serve as people, the story is still the same. You know, I want to get a job, but I don't have a mailbox. I don't have an address. I had an interview, but I needed my ID or I didn't have my birth certificate. And so I just think sometimes people don't realize how easy it is to help someone, but how difficult the system makes it. And it's broken. And from every state that we went to, from Texas, um, El Paso, Dallas, um, New Mexico, even in New Mexico, um, there are 
just people who and you're talking about in New Mexico where it is extremely hot, Arizona, extremely hot. You're seeing people who are just um, living out on the streets. Um, no water, no food. And I'm saying this is America and not a lot of shelters. Um, you're talking about the reservations um, that are being overlooked. They're tucked away because we know why, <laughs> right? But at the end of the day, um, they're not getting the resources that they need as well. We, had a, we went to Oklahoma City, um, even in Flagstaff, Arizona, I was blown away because we were able to drive, I'll say at the bottom, and then we came back through the top of each state that we visited going. Um, and so what I, I realized, even in Flagstaff, Arizona, I was like, how are all these homeless people? So we had a conversation with a couple of guys there. And one young man told me, he said, you know what? I had a job opportunity to come here, um, I think from New York. So he got there, they did the work, but they didn't need him anymore. And he was staying, of course, in a, a, a motel. Um, and so when he couldn't make his uh, stay uh, payment, he found himself there. But in his situation, he didn't have family to call back to go home to. Um, because a lot of times we, sometimes people pursue dreams like that. Um, even to, like I said, going out to LA or places like that, but your dreams don't always make it. So what happens? And I just, I don't know. I just think from the time we left, from the time we came back, it took us 16 days. We went over 6,000 uh, 6, miles. And when we included the miles, uh, we were talking about just driving around, doing the work as well. But um, I realized for myself that there is so much land out there. You drive through Oklahoma flat land, just, tr just grass and, you know, cattle here, grass here, and the mountains over there. And I'm saying to myself, we have too much land in America for people not to have a place to live. It's just crazy i mean i know we have cities i get it but we can do something yeah when you're in a crisis like this an epidemic as this any means necessary to make it work for the people yes especially now when the moratoriums are lifted hopefully they will extend it but we don't know and even if they continue to extend it this has to be paid back so america will be skid row Yes. on steroids yes. so if we don't utilize the land that we have and it it's not owned by anyone <laughs> as empaths okay. and as we exactly. think exactly. we don't think that this is ownership but we were given all of this That's true. to have this human experience the other part of that too is that um we haven't even seen the impact that this pandemic is going to do to people and so you know even now before the pandemic to talk about mental illness was unheard of, especially in the black community, not talking about going to, you know, talking about therapy and all of those things. But at the end of the day, um, our children are home 24 seven now, um, not allowed to go out really to get the, the um, exercise that they're used to being around their, their, their friends. And so, like you just said, they're going to a lot of, at the end of this month, they're going to a lot of be a lot of people who are going to lose their homes. And even if they do extend it, there's, I mean, there are going to be some landlords that just don't care. And that's what I'm talking about. We're, we're going back to, uh, for every state, Georgia, Louisiana, New Mexico, Dallas, I mean, Texas, um, California, Coming on back to Oklahoma and te Tennessee, all of these places that we had an opportunity to touch, we're still going back to that same conversation. You have food banks for people who um, who need it, families who need it. Come up, drive up. You have your senior citizens roll out wheels on meal, meals on wheels that go to their senior citizens. But no one is talking about the homeless community. No one is saying we need to convoy to go out and make sure that these people have a place to stay and eat. And the common denominator is if you're seeing this on all these states that you travel to, that means they don't care. The ones that are in charge don't care. I mean, point blank, period. You may have this job and you may care sometimes, but you don't care enough to really stop this same old, same old system that we've been going through that is obviously not working. So you don't care enough to change legislature. You see what I mean? So something is really sad where it's a trending event. 
going back to you saying the holidays, right? And then January, you won't see people. So we need to stop making this a trending thing and it's popular. What can we do to educate the masses? Because a lot of people just don't know where they can send people. This is all they know to do is feed and give. Yes, sir. That's, 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 that's what true. everybody does, you know? So if we had people that we can see that get from behind those office desks <laughs> and come out in the streets, then we can be familiar to say, this person works here and has a program that can change your life that's right. In a week. That's right. You know? and, 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 and that was a part of why I wanted to do the cross country trip, because I was able to see some of the things that were actually working. Yes. And so when you can get grassroots organizations in the same room or on the same conference call and share their ideas, because for me, if you can feed 500 people and I can feed 500, that's a thousand I have eaten. And that's to me, that's everything. So, for instance, there were states that had programs for bicycles. You know, where, where the, when people leave or the cops confiscate bicycles, they would donate them to a local shelter because these this may be the only means of transportation for people to go to work. So people are thinking that homeless are just lazy bums sleeping on the street. They don't have anywhere to go. They don't do nothing all day. Um, and so now it's like, OK, so when we serve as a person who is in their tent, who has on a Walmart vest, who's getting ready to go to work, he have to walk or or look for, uh, ask for bus fare to get to work. People are not wrapping their head around that concept because that's actually happening. We're seeing this on the street. Um, and then if you do that and continue to miss work, you're gonna lose your job. Exactly. Exactly. And then, but your ultimate thing is people that are clueless about homelessness will say, well, won't you just get a job? Mm -hmm. Many people have a job. It's more of trying to keep that job because there's no resources available for them to even have a good night's sleep right. so they can mentally be rested to right. work the That's next right. day. If all... you're going to fall asleep all day long because you didn't rest the night before, yes, your um, your boss is going to fire you. And then, then also I had an opportunity to witness this, not just in California, but here in Atlanta, that they are adopting the opposite of what is good for those who are in need. So for instance, when I first visited California some years ago, I recognized that all of the restrooms and local um, in the in the establishments like, you know, Burger King or something had a lock on them. You had to have a password or had to have a key. And um, I'm thinking to myself, OK, so what is this about? Well, that was to deter people from coming in and cleaning up on and on and on. Well, um, I noticed in Atlanta in a couple of Starbucks I visited downtown, they had started to. Do. So now we're doing the opposite of trying to help. But now we are taking the politics of it, of what we don't want to see. And then now we're actually turning against those who are in need. And to me, that is um, disheartening. It is, um, I think it's inhumane. And again, there, there is another group, a sector, I don't believe that want to see people do better. I think there is a financial uh, star that comes with people in transition. I think, you know, when uh, big companies, um, you know, um, spread the wealth and they're utilizing um, some of the nonprofits that they donate to, um, they need that olive branch to, 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 to give off some funds so that they can write off some taxes and so on and so forth. And so at the end of the day, it is a market for some people. You know, and but when you are out on the ground and you're talking to people every day, when you're you're looking somebody in their eyes and they're just asking for, um, you know, the basics or they're trying to figure out, hey, do you know who I can talk to about this situation? We saw a young lady a couple of weeks ago who had five kids and she was trying to find a place that she can go and take all of her kids and not have to be separated. And so when you're on the ground and you having these conversations, but you don't know, you don't have an answer for it. It's disheartening, but then you have people who have the money, who have the means, and they're not having a discussion. And if you did, ha if we did have an answer for it, the people we're going to send them to are the people that are in charge of the whole deal. Hence the United Ways, hence the Salvation Armies, hence the Continuum of Cares. But then you can see them, we can refer them, right? And we can see them in the same place a month later because they still didn't get the resources that they needed. But these are the ultimate people that supposedly can help you or guide you to 
the other resources for your situation. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. But then we see that they've gone through a rat race yeah. to end up in the same spot again. So I know that these people know that this shit is not working. Yes. Yes. But yeah. they continue to stay yeah. in these well, positions. I, and how come somebody can get paid 40000 to to $100,000 to take care of somebody that has nothing? Well, I don't get it. I would donate half my salary. <laughs> you have no idea. I, believe me, you know that I know. Because I know what we bring in every year. And I know it doesn't even compare to the work that we've been able to do. And if we didn't have in-kind donations, we would not even be in existence right now because it's totally not about the money for us because we just not bringing it in like that. But because we are getting the in-kind, but I, I agree with you because at the end of the day, you know, I could, I, I don't even think I could see myself um, in that position and knowing that I have been on the ground for years and seeing people living in tents and living in their cars and you know and uh sleeping at somebody grandmama's house in the basement with 20 other people like you know we have to wrap our heads around it and even now you know i'm grateful for the movement that i hear that's moving in atlanta that people are able to get into apartments what i am still looking for is to help them stay there because from my experience of what I've seen with my own eyes is that there are people who are blessed to get those uh, vouchers and to get into a space, but they don't all make it. I've seen at least four people that I experienced to help that they're now back on the streets because they couldn't either comply with what they were supposed to do. They couldn't make it to their uh, um, uh, appointments uh or they, couldn't uh, pay the rent. they couldn't pay the rent they couldn't pay the utilities whatever it was asked of them but the problem is that you can give them vouchers all day long but if you don't give them wraparound services and see what each individual person needs then you're only first of all you're doing injustice to that person because that's a whole roller coaster emotional roller coaster they're going through i'm on the streets devastated whatever now i'm so happy i have a home i'm this now i'm on the verge of losing it now i'm back in the streets you see there's yes. this yo-yo effect and that's why people just become complacent i don't want to do this anymore i'm just ready to give up and anybody will start feeling that way if you keep getting these that's true. That's true. false positives that's true that's true there again here is the system that there are programs but they're not working because the programs are not actually being, to me, they're not actually being utilized the way they need to be. You know, sometimes you can get the money and say, we're going to do this. And you may have the coffee on the table and the donuts and you may have the chairs. But if you don't have the people in the chairs to sit down at the program that you have, you know, deemed all of this money to help this person. Mm -hmm. And then right now, you know, a lot of people always talk about the red tape, the red tape. It's always this red tape. We got to go through a super political zoning. This like we can't, we just can't, we can't freaking figure it out. I mean, it's been a century, I feel like, or half a century to be like, won't you start when, you know, at least. And maybe 10 years later, we'll have a yeah, solution. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. But you got to stop talking about the barriers and break down the barriers yeah. because you're the one that's creating the barriers. And, and also, you know, there's a component where there's a trust factor. I mean, anybody, you know, you want people to trust you. So even the person who goes out to the street, um, as often as we do, there is some trust. And so it takes time to build that up, right? And so when you have these programs that don't work and you're telling people you're gonna do this and then it doesn't happen for them, they don't want to trust somebody. They don't wanna say, okay, I'll, 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 I'll give it a try because at that point, they've, they're already broken. They've already gone through so many, so much disappointment, so much in their lives. And so when you come, you gotta come right. And you gotta come right. And why you gotta always have to take somebody into an office? That's true. That's why can't you just sit there and you, 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 right. bam, right. we gonna, we gonna right. cop a squat right. Right. <laughs> and we gonna start now. But the thing about it is, if you look at some of these um, people who do the work without the titles, mm -hmm. Um, who have who are billionaires and millionaires who do who have the money they just go and build the places they don't work like you said they don't worry about the red tape and then they're not judgmental about who comes in and that's another thing and when it's politics it's vetted people you know well he, he has a disability you know he can come in but you can't because you might be a troublemaker well let's find out why
But the hard part of the trip was to get back in the car and to realize that we have driven 3,000 miles in every place that we stopped, every night that we slept in a state that we were seeing the same thing. We were hearing the same stories. There were different faces, but there were the same stories. And it was disheartening um, just to see the lack of attention, the lack of humanity, the lack of concern that people were actually during the pandemic living outside. And I still cannot even I've been back probably a couple of months. I cannot wrap my head around that people <laughs> during the pandemic don't have the basics. And then let's talk about Atlanta specifically with this hostile architecture as we call it. We're in a pandemic, right? Okay. A bridge you told me about, Prior Street Bridge. Yes. I served, you served under that bridge, those that are without walls. And you told me about the boulders and the gravel and the rocks, all that stuff that they put up there. And I'm like, what? It was like, what, 25 tents up there. Where did these people go? You know, so I, we, me and my friend, we rode by there and it was just devastating to see the links that they went to just to keep people out. And they were, this is the safest place for them to be right now because they can physically distance, you know, and people are visible to see them where you don't have to really search because a lot of people aren't getting the needs, their needs met because it's hard to find them. And that's, clearly stated they have to do that or they may get swept or who knows or they may lose their life who knows so that's why they have to go in these hidden places but then unfortunately they're not getting the resources or being seen by the people like you and I so now we have this going on do you know where these people are are well one of the things that I have noticed um, again we've been doing this now about six years um, I had an opportunity to see the boulders, I think, before it even hit the news. Um, it was very disheartening for me to see that because you're right, they went through, a, they went to a lot to do that, spent a lot of money. I have also witnessed people moving further out. And this was before the boulders. I've seen um, even in the bucket area, places where you wouldn't normally see tents. Uh, in different counties, you know, Atlanta is broken up in, in I mean, Georgia is broken up in, in different, I mean, Atlanta broken up in different counties. So um, in places like, for instance, a mall, and you look across the street and it's a tent right in front of AutoZone, you know, and, and that's something that you haven't seen ever, right? I think what I am learning in doing this work, and I'm still learning, is that we are so divided with politics. We're so divided with organizations who have already um, made great impacts in the community. And I don't know if it's a, a thing where uh, we'll let you in if, or we need to vet. I don't know, but I do know that there are a lot of people out here doing great work, right? And so in this time, I have never received a phone call from a big organization to say, Erica, we need or can you help or will you take this section? So for me to see something as drastic as that could have been utilized to put a program in place so that I don't go on Sundays and you don't go on Mondays and, and this organization don't go on Tuesdays, but we all come together and figure out how we can be effective in all of the counties and do this work together. So I don't even know, to be honest, because the last two years I have really been uh, trying to reach out to church, churches, church faith based um, organizations, um, some of the city council, um, even some at city hall to say, hey, we're here. What can we do? If you don't want me to do this, if you don't want me to feed, 
what do you want me to do? Because I am willing to sacrifice in a pandemic to be out here to service this community that I, I deem is just as important as anybody else. Tell me what you want me to do. And I think that is the biggest thing that we are missing in the city of Atlanta, that we have some great people who are willing to sacrifice their time, their treasures, and to be out here to do the work. But we're not getting the call. And what did they say when you proposed all this? Haven't heard anything. Oh, so you just left messages. I leave. I talk to some people and I get um I a lot of times I get passed to somebody else. Just is this honest. a you think it's an <laughs> ego thing with the organizations? Is uh, it ego? I, I want to be the only one that's doing it. I want to be. Recognized. I think it I comes to funding because even as as a. But you're not seeking that. Right, 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 right. Because to me, I when God gave me this blessing, God told me don't do the work. The the the, the resources would come. I just did something last week about I am the servant and not servant and not the source, and so I know that. The, the 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 source the resources will come to us if we're doing the work and that's what I feel around the board so those who have the finances I just think that the programs I mean if, if they work great but obviously something's not working because there are too many people um, out here on the streets and now and I would say this let me tell you something else I saw last week uh, well I saw it a couple of months ago but last week, it really hit me. Um, there's a quarter, um, the 70, the 75 uh, coming from 20 quarter, once you get on there, that ramp, there had to be about six guys that morning with signs asking for change on a ramp, on a busy city of Atlanta highway is unheard of. This is something that you see somewhere else. And so when you say what you don't want to see here in Atlanta, you have to start doing something different. And all I'm saying for the last six years, I, I do see some movement. I will say that. I'll be the first to say that. I see some movement. But I really don't believe that it's enough. Because at the end of the day, people who live without walls, they need us. Period. And until, sometimes until this happens to somebody else, they don't want to see it. But when when your middle class and upper middle class began to move out into the streets during COVID, maybe somebody will see it and pay attention because it'll really be like, that's my neighbor or that's my, they're good people. You know, everyone else is just not good in their eyes. Everybody else just has this stereotypical label on them. But when it becomes your so-called People with homes, average people, which they are the same, but this is the division we have in our mind. But when it becomes more of, oh my gosh, now I feel, because they're projecting 50 to 60 million people. That's ridiculous. Oh, it is. I mean, but you, you know, this is the thing. If any, any, the average person is sitting home during this pandemic, and if they have the, the, uh, if they're afforded to be able to watch TV at this time, you know, we're having cable or just an antenna, right? And you're watching the news and you see these lines that are wrapped around that, you know, people trying to get a food box. And we're talking about a box that probably only have a gallon of milk and a couple of vegetables, boom, boom, boom. But they're waiting in line for six and seven hours. If that is not a wake up call, I don't even think they are, are thinking about what it's gonna look like. And so for me, instead of, you know, uh, doing this every, week to rah 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 hey look what we're doing let's sit down at the table and let's start projecting january february so what do you expect people to do is it is this their fault you constantly closing down businesses because they the first shutdown a lot of people went out of business right? right and a lot of people are barely holding on that could make it you know that we can still do this we can do this we just gotta you know cut corners and figure this out bam i got it we're up and running we're doing outside we're doing this complying to all of your political rules and then here comes the second shutdown now that's totally wiping them out they cannot recover from that but then they're still going to have to pay all of that so when i say moratoriums forget moratoriums how about we erase everything I just don't everything they, and then they, nobody they has practice. to yeah nobody has to owe anybody that's anything right. that's what i said i said so, the same thing flatline it all thank you flatline it all and, and give people give people something to eat first of all no one in america should be hungry i'm sorry no one no one should be hungry 
It's crazy. It doesn't make sense to me. And you may think this is somebody else's problem. Well, United Way got it or, or Gateway got it or whoever got it. But that's not the case. And we're here to let you know. And that. I'm here to let you know that this line is longer and longer and longer every day, every week that I come out. And I'm seeing different faces. I'm seeing, you know, it, there's no age on it. There's no color. This Even our cross-country trip showed us that what I've been saying, it is dead on. There is no face to people who are in need. It's just not a face. You know, people want to think. Well, oh, it was a bunch of faces. You know, a lot of, it's you know, black. yeah, it's, it's like, oh, 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 it's all black men, you know, or it's women who should have done this and they didn't, you know, and it's, it's that. But it's like, no, sweetie, it is grandma who may have lost her husband but didn't have kids. And she sat there for a couple of days and psychologically couldn't get it together and found herself in a situation. Like, people don't get when, it, when we talk about situations, like, right? Until, until the top start having conversations with the middle and the bottom, uh, and who has the funding, um, it's just going to be a cycle. It's just gonna be and we just got to get angry and we just got to get loud and then <laughs> keep promoting and say, hey, eventually somebody's going to hear somebody's it. And yes, we are talking about you. Yeah. Give us a reason not to. Or give us a reason to talk about you positively. Because <laughs> yeah. I would never recommend any of your services because of the people that are coming back to me saying that they That's have true. not received anything. Or, or, I mean, I'll use this. But a waste of time. I use this shelter down here, uh, close to where we are right here on, on Peter Street. Um, I watch this about, I think it's only for men. And every day I'm wondering why there are so many guys in this area but they only accept so many people a night, right? So the challenging part, what if I do have a job and I have to, I don't get off to six or seven o'clock? Well, you have to be there at 4.30. If you're not in line at a certain time, you're not gonna get in. And the line is so long because they know they only have so many beds. And then the story of the private ran shelter is, you know, it's so the list is long and you know, if you don't go to church and you don't eat their food and you don't do this. You don't get a cot. You don't get a shower. You don't get, you know, and like it, you're a toddler. Exactly. And so at the end of the day, I'm not saying, you know, you let people just do whatever they want to do. I'm not saying that. But some of the guidelines are already conditioned to for people to fail. There were several shelters we uh, visited in California that to me, once we were able to go in to do our drop off donation, you know, I had gave, gave me an opportunity to look around and I'm thinking to myself, why are all of these tents on the outside? Because you're not packed. You're not full, but you can say you are because that goes back to money. That goes back to funding. That goes back to say, I have a thousand beds and they're full. I'm not going to come in there and see if you're full because you can have somebody go and make sure the restaurant is clean and give them a score. But they don't, I don't, to my knowledge, to no my knowledge, expected. there are nobody's expecting these shelters to make sure that you have a thousand people because I'm sending you enough for a thousand people to be taken care of. So when you get the funding, you do, you say you're doing the programs, but how do we know? Because on the outside of these shelters is tent city all down. And when you talk to them and I'm like, well, why are you not in the shelter? They say they don't have room for us. And then the other part, people don't realize you have to start building facilities where people can house their stuff you know you want to pack people into a certain place but if this is all i got this is all i have why can't you have lockers lockers have some type of little storage places or have a room and put your name on it have someone they sign just to so, this this storage unit so we're in right now the, have your name and a tag on there that when you get up that. the next day the person what's your name and hand you your it's your it's belongings it's and that's the main reason why people will sit there and suffer and get wet and go that's through right. hypothermia yeah. because they want to protect their belongings because if they have that bed you don't have any clothes or any supplies afterwards that's right. and that day is gone so anyway i don't want to hold up too much money more of your time because we can go on and on and on and on and on and, on. and i just want to ask one more question okay. is what are you manifesting now ah great so i had an opportunity actually two weeks ago to just really uh be still and um see our direction for 2021 uh we in prayer will lead into 2021 with three main uh focus on those who are unsheltered those who are in shelter and we're definitely going to work with our children 
because we know that they are also in need. Uh, we will travel to uh, New York. We're going to try to travel to New York in January around the 15th and we'll distribute the hygiene kit. So next year is going to be uh, a phrase of you first is committed to love. That's our phrase. Uh, we are committed to being using our own selves to sacrifice to be out here for the good of the people. Um, I think that um, we are overlooked and it's okay. Uh, this is a work that I'm committed to doing. Um, I think 2020, 2020, I mean, sorry, 2021 is going to be um, very challenging because at the end of the day, uh, we haven't seen the effect of uh, the coronavirus. And um, I do think we need to speak up a little bit more about getting people not just off the streets, but definitely getting them the medical assistance that they need because a person's life depends on it. Depends on it. It depends on it. So thank you so much for being on the thank show you. again. Well, thank you. Glad yeah. to be here. Can't wait to come back. <laughs> yay, yay. Right. So we're going to continue with that or with your tip of the week that you gave last week because that can go on now. We got to constantly be in the streets, especially during what's going on is getting cold. Provide what you can. Sorry. You know, even if you're going to bring a meal, provide a blanket, a pillow, socks, whatever, because hand warmers, like you can go to the dollar store and get those hand warmers and they work wonders. And please just tell the people, if you're going to donate something, if you're going to give somebody something, do not give them something that's not clean. I know that's right. I just wanted to say that. I think about you and what you would like to receive. And that's how we give. Please. <laughs> all right love you too. love you too <laughs> peace and blessings all right so make sure you follow no address documentary.com for more information and also our social media pages no address doc on instagram and facebook so i do want to make a side note and i would like for everyone to send positive healing energies to Erica. Since this podcast, she was in an accident in her van. Someone hit her on the highway and totaled the van that Tyler Perry gave her. So unfortunately, she wasn't able to do her travels to New York this month, but we wanna lift her up. She is recovering well. So continue to send that good healing, positive energy to her mind, body, and spirit so she can continue to do what she does along her journey. And hopefully she will be blessed with another van to continue to serve. Love you, sis. I hope you are doing well. And until next time, this is the No Address Podcast.